Over the last 10 years, we've seen an enormous expansion of the influence of social media. For example, I'm about to head to the CHI 2015 conference where the musician Psy is going to give the closing keynote. And the idea of a world famous uh, pop star giving a keynote talk at a computer science conference would seem unthinkable just a few short years ago. And what's interesting about it is in Psy's biography, uh, he refers to himself as a social media innovator, also something that it seems like just a few short years ago that wasn't the sort of thing that rock stars did. Um, and I bet many of you know Psy, but one reason that he's relevant for our story today is that part of his fame outside of Korea, he's been uh, extremely well known inside of South Korea for a long time, but part of his global fame came from his video Gangnam Style. And this video has become so popular that it even broke the YouTube counter. There were more than two billion people who viewed this video, so many that it broke the integer size that YouTube originally set up to store how many views a video got in their database. Here's a common social question. Uh, are you free on Thursday at 3? And I think the answer is, uh, well, it depends on, uh, on who's asking. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Bill Gates dropped by campus, and I had the opportunity to meet him. And you know, when Bill Gates uh, calls and says, hey, are you free, uh, the answer is absolutely. Uh, on the other hand, I think many of us have had the experience of there's a low priority meeting where you're not that heavily involved anyway, or something that you may not have wanted to go to anyhow. And in that case, um, the answer to am I free on Thursday at 3 is um, you know, maybe no. And uh, the reason that I bring this up for our discussion today is that, as we'll see when we start to look at shared calendars, uh, social life is contextual. And the question of if it depends on who's asking, it's not a tiny trifle to be dealt with at the end. It's actually very much at the core uh, of our social reality. And so because social interaction is context specific, you know, the way that you present yourself and handle yourself and the conversations you have at a bar or on the beach with friends, that's really different than the way that you might interact uh, at the office or a family gathering. Uh, and that's a good thing. You know, it's an expression of the sophistication of human culture. And the challenge is that technology, that's the stuff that's easiest to build, uh, often ignores that. The fact that our uh, social lives are so multidimensional and context specific. That can be a pain from the vantage point of software development. For example, in the, on Facebook, you know, everybody is your friend, but there's a big difference between uh, my sister or a cousin or a best friend or a spouse or a coworker that you know really well or somebody that you met once at a conference seven years ago and barely remember, or somebody that you may not have wanted to respond to a friend query to, but you didn't want to be rude and say no. And so all of these things, unless we're careful, can get collapsed. And that collapsing can cause problems in the way that social media works. And so what we're going to look at today are what some of these problems are and what we can do as a designer to be able to address them. A lot of this shows up because we've moved from the individual user era into the social computing era. You know, in the individual user world, you've got a, uh, your single computer, and uh, we've got our laptop here, and life is good, uh, and there's a single person, and they are at their desk doing some work. All right. And here, the challenges of interaction design are largely about supporting an individual's user workflow. Is the interface clear and self-disclosing? Is it expressive in the ways that it needs to be? On the other hand, when you think about a social computing system, a lot of the things that you're trying to support with technology, you still have all of those, can I figure out what the user interface is doing? Is it clear? Do I know what's going on? But you have all of these new challenges, too of supporting all of the interactions or not between users. 
One of the people who describes this best is the San Diego cognitive science alum, Jonathan Gruden. Uh, after he graduated, he started working on social computing. And the challenges of, of doing that motivated him to uh, write this really, really great article about the, the difficulties of group work. And one of his favorite examples is that of a calendar. If you think about a shared calendar from the vantage point of somebody who's a manager, uh, well, these things are great because a manager's got a lot of meetings, and so you got some time blocked off here, and some time blocked off here, and some time blocked off here. Uh, and on Friday, you go surfing. And it's been really nice to be able to see other people's calendars as well. And so we might see some more calendar information from other people that overlays. And if I want to be able to make a meeting, we can find a, a block of free time that works. But what about from a worker's perspective? Well, here there's a couple of challenges. Uh, the first one is that um, a lot of the information about what you need to do might be just in your head and not in the system itself. Another one is that the time that's not scheduled on your calendar, that's when uh, you have actual work. That's when work gets done. So free time isn't free. That's the, that's the real work time. Also, different people might use infra different infrastructure. So one person might use a Microsoft system. Somebody else is using Google Calendar. Somebody else is using a paper day planner, each of which has its own merits and reasons why you'd use it and all that stuff. But they may or may not interact. And the fourth one, as we talked about the, at the beginning of this video, is that it, the availability depends on who's asking. So here we see a central challenge of making cooperative software work, that there can be a disparity between the person who does the work and the person who gets the benefit. And you see that in the case of calendars, because managers who have to coordinate all these different schedules, they get a big benefit by being able to have a consistent view of everybody's work. On the other hand, uh, the individual users, if they keep a shared calendar for the purposes of coordination, well, for them, the cost exceeds the benefit. And so we have, for workers, uh, the cost is higher. And for managers, well, the benefit might be higher. But the shared calendar only works if everybody uses it. There's a network effect. And so to get the benefit of being able to line all these up, you need to have everybody use it. Now, there's lots of ways that you can address the challenges. And I think different systems have done that in different ways. One way of addressing the challenges is what we see with Doodle. So Doodle is a web application that enables you to schedule an individual meeting. And so if we want to be able to find a couple of free hours to meet this week, maybe for a dissertation defense, it's important to be able to find free time. Um, all of the people involved may use different calendaring systems or have preferences about when they'd prefer to meet or not. And again, our availability depends on who's asking. But by putting this in something like Doodle, uh, you're asking an answer not in general, are you free, but are you free at this particular time? Here's another example with Google Calendar where as the Google infrastructure integrates more and more services, the cost of being able to keep a shared calendar gets smaller. The user interface e gets easier. The integration gets smoother. And the benefits start to get larger. And so even for an individual worker, the relationship between those two can flip. One way that you can see this is by integrating email and calendar. And so one way of both lowering the friction of using a piece of software, decreasing the cost, and adding value is that we can, by showing my calendar in the context of an email that comes in asking about a, a calendar-relevant query, uh, it makes it a lot easier to answer that. And so I'm incented to participate and keep things in there. And then I can just hit a single button to be able to add that to the calendar. Another challenge of building social software 
is being able to handle exceptions. One thing that is extraordinary about human social interaction is that people are extremely good at extemporizing and exception handling, so much so that we often don't realize how much of it we're doing. We've seen this especially in recent years with regard to uh, medical records. You don't realize how much extemporizing is going on until you try to replace it with a system that doesn't allow that kind of extemporizing. So Christian Heath and Paul Luff and many other researchers have looked at how doctors actually use medical records, in part because when electronic health records started to appear, there was a surprisingly large amount of pushback and frustration for those that were using it. One of the things that you see with, with paper medical records is that they encode a lot more than just what officially goes into the, the form fields. So for example, when a paper medical record is on somebody's desk, you know that they're likely to be the person who has the most recent information. If a paper medical record is worn and dog-eared, well that means that there's been a lot of activity, whereas one that's brand new and stiff means it sees, it's seen less interest. When something is provisional, it might get written in in pencil and then only later transferred to pen. You can even tell sometimes who it was that entered that information and be able to infer based on that some additional information or know who to ask if you have a question about that. Now all of these benefits of paper health records doesn't mean that there aren't benefits to the digital world. So if we look at a digital interface, we see that it's extremely easy to search. It's extremely easy to aggregate across patients. Uh, when somebody moves, shipping digital files is a lot easier. They can also be in multiple places at the same time. There's lots of benefits of the digital world. Computers generally write better than doctors, so there's a handwriting benefit there as well. And it's easier to automatically integrate sensors, enrich multimedia, and all that stuff. Electronic rec health records clear have, clearly have huge benefits. And so uh, when we look about the benefits of paper records, I think the question is not so much, are we going to keep paper around forever uh, for every single task, but rather, how can we marry the benefits of the paper world with those that we see in the digital world? And I think that health records have become particularly challenging, because if you think about the relationship between a doctor and a pa patient, in the paper world, well, you've got a doctor, and they've got the paper in front of them, and you've got the patient just right here, and they can see each other. But when you change over to the computer world, then you can have a situation where the doctor now is typing into a computer. And then the patient is over here. And they're wondering why on earth nobody's paying attention to them. And this loss in bedside rapport is something that can have real health consequences, where if I tell you something looking in the eyes, you may be much more willing to listen to it. And if I'm, on the other hand, turned around, that's not going to work nearly as well. You may be even less disclosive if we're not having eye contact. And so I think it, here you can see there's lots of ways that you could remedy this. And, and people are working on it. And I think the best electronic health systems address many of these issues. What I think is notable is that with all of the examples that we've seen of groupware here, the extemporizing, the coordination, the change in the locus of power, the change in who gets the benefit, what things get easier and what things get harder, if you don't pay attention to all of these subtle variables, the ship of your social computing system can mysteriously sink without you knowing why. Here's another wonderful example. Uh, for many years, possibly still to this day, uh, airline traffic controllers have used paper flight strips. And this is research from Wendy McKay and colleagues. What I love is you can see these yellow paper flight strips. They encode all of the relevant detail about a particular flight. And what you see here in this picture is that there's an airline traffic controller who is responsible for the flight strips that are directly in front of them. So anybody in that room can
can know who is responsible for what. Furthermore, if I want to be able to hand a flight to you, I do that physically, and the passing of the physical token makes extremely clear who's in charge. There's little room for ambiguity. Often, digital systems lose that really strong token passing, and that open loop communication where you've lost the confirmation and the common ground awareness that I know that you know that I know, that's when systems have problems. And again, uh, it's not like we couldn't replace this with a digital system, but that many of the subtle coordination benefits that paper and physical systems support, we want to think about how we might make those more possible and also get the benefits of, of the digital era. And something that's almost tautological, but I think nonetheless profound, is that if a technology is going to provide an advantage, well, at some point, the correspondence with the real world has to break down. That the reason that we're looking to a digital health record is because it can do all of these things that a paper health record might not be able to do. And yet, um, if we jump too far too fast without checking what happens, uh, we can run into real trouble. And so one good heuristic for being able to design effective social computing systems is to be really attentive to current practice. Think about what people do now. And then all things equal work to minimize that distance. The benefit there is not only might you keep some of the interactional benefits of the paper world, but also people have to relearn less. And so onboarding of new users can be a lot easier. And so in conclusion, what you, we see here is that if we want to build social computing apps that a world of extemporizers actually adopts, in general, the more flexible things are, uh, the better. For example, uh, Twitter, which I think of as an extremely successful social computing platform in terms of its enormous adoption, this short messaging platform is extremely free form. There's not a lot of structure. And the structure that has emerged, things like hashtags, many of them first emerged as user community conventions that over time became more and more strongly adopted into the platform. The flexibility enables that end user innovation. And I think Twitter is a great example of how these flexible, lightweight tools are much more used than the more highly prescribed ones. And that paper is often one of our best examples of something that is lightweight, that's flexible, and that supports extemporizing. And so now the design challenge for all of you as we build a digital world is how we can enable one that has all of this wonderful micro-coordination that we're used to in the analog one.